And we got Showtime Joe Farrell with us. Joe, thank you so much for talking to us at last minute. I really appreciate it. No problem. It's actually Showdown Joe. People have called me. Uh, I've got Showtime Joe. <laughs> I had Shogun Joe back in my UFC days. I've had Sit Down Joe. I've had all kinds of stuff like that. But it's, it's uh, actually, you know what? I, I don't even know if I use Showdown Joe anymore, to be honest with you. I mean, that was the brand. That's what people uh, know me as. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting ride. Uh, 20 years in this game and you know, things go up and down and things change. But uh, still love it a day by day. Well, my apologies. Showdown, Joe. Showdown, Joe. Uh, that works. Showdown, Joe. And by the way, hello, Mr. Ferraro. How are hello, you? Hello, sir. How are you? I'm doing all right. Well, I just want to basically tell you that we're not going to filter your thoughts or anything, even though this is going to be like a short interview. But is there anything that you don't want us to talk about? Oh, Chris, Chris, we're, Chris, we already started. We already started. We already started. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You guys can uh, ask me anything you want, anything you want. Don't worry about it. I mean, if, if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll let you know. But other than that, you can ask away. It's not a problem well, whatsoever. My, my first question to you, Joe, is uh, how does it feel back to be at Ryzen? Uh, it's been almost an almost, almost entire year. How does it feel? Yeah. Back? Yeah. It's, um, um, well, I mean, I'm sure you guys understand how the, how the Japanese work and how they think uh, and their business mm-hmm. practices and stuff like that. So it's, it's, I'm so glad when I, when I got the message, uh, from Shingo that, you know, you listen, we're going to have Frank and you back for the show here. Um, like I didn't even know what to do at the time last year, once the show was over, because you never know. Uh, I've been in this game long enough that I treat every event um, like it's my last event. Right. Um, if you guys can see behind me, like those are all the UFC events that I covered. Right. I've got frame after frame after frame of every single pass. Um, but I, I used to tell my associate producers or cameramen, whenever we went uh, to any UFC show, even when I was sitting um, octagon side, as an example, I would take a minute uh, and seize the moment, just seize it because this could be your last. I've always believed that. So if you seize the moment, you'll do your best work. Uh, you'll have, a, you know, you'll have a good time and, and you'll just be just, it's good for your aura in general. Um, so the last show for rise in last year, um, we had no idea what was going on. And I, I learned a while ago that you just, just treat everything, like I said, like it's your last time. Uh, and then you'll just be cool if it does end. Uh, and then after, you know, then January came around, we didn't know what was going on, all the different situations that was happening with the broadcast partnerships. Uh, Frank and I had no idea if we were going to be back. So, you know, it, on, on my own social media, I generally keep things as fresh and as correct as possible. I never removed rise and play by play because I just didn't know if, if it was truly over, maybe we were just on delay. Uh, and that delay went two months, three months, five months, six months, eight months to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to wait till New Year's Eve. We'll see what happens with New Year's Eve. If it's officially one year since I've done a show, then I'll change my social media up and then just get back to what I'm doing. But then we got the, the, the message saying, listen, we're going to have you guys on. Uh, we're going to figure out how we're going to do it because you can't fly to Japan. Uh, if you fly to Japan, you gotta, you're going to have to leave the beginning of December, and it's now too late. Uh, then you have to quarantine for 14 days, uh, and then all that jazz. So what do we do? Uh, and, you know, being the Japanese and modern day technology, they figured out a way to, you know, we have another audio and video test tonight, but I'll be doing it from this room here. Uh, Frank will be in LA. I'll be here just north of Toronto, and we'll be taking it from there. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, it kind yeah, of- you know what? It is kind of crazy because... You know, you basically saying you don't know when your next event is your last event. I mean, I originally thought that back in February when Matt Stryker was doing the commentary for fight that, you know, y'all ran y'all course, unfortunately. But, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of crazy to even think of rising English commentary without you or Mr. Trigg involved. Yeah, I, I, that wasn't our, our decision. I mean, that that's something that... Um... And we knew Ryzen, I don't, I, I don't know if Ryzen really had their, their hands tied uh, or handcuffed in any manner, but we understood what was going on and it was cool. It's okay. Uh, it is what it is. And, 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 you know, and then we started getting messages like, when are you guys coming back? When are you guys coming back? And I'm like, well, I don't, we don't really have a say. Uh, you know, we want you guys back. We want you guys back. It's not the same. And I, I, didn't, I didn't listen to the other shows. I didn't uh, technically watch other shows. And, you know, I don't know if it was a good job done and not so good job done. I don't mind. It, it is what it is. And, and you're, not, you're not doing something forever. Uh, I'm not stamped with Ryzen, uh, although I do, like, I, I can't explain to you guys how awesome the shows are. Like, when you're there live, it is insane. And they treat Frank and I like royalty. And when I say royalty, I mean at the highest level of class you can ever imagine. So when you get treated like that, you're going to put in that extra effort. You're going to try and do your best. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I've often been accused of, of mispronouncing uh, a lot of the names and I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? I'm doing the best I can. Like, if you think I'm, I'm purposely mispronouncing names, that's on you. That's not on me. Like I do the very <laughs> best I can. Again, I'm Canadian. So some of the things aren't going to come off like some people uh, in the States or some people in Europe or some people in Australia are going to like or understand. And I'm, I'm totally cool with that. It is how I speak. Uh, but yeah, I do my very best to make sure that the pronunciations are done correctly. Uh, and we have a lot of fun. I mean, how many times has Frank ripped me during a show? Like, I mean, if, if you guys had a drinking game where how many times Frank Trigg rips Joe Ferraro on a broadcast, you'd be hammered by the end of the show, right? So that's, that's uh, we have a lot of fun with that. Either that or how many times y'all rip Jason Herzog whenever he referees a fight or is near you, y'all. <laughs> Poor Jason. Frank and Jason. Are, I, I mean, I know Jason very well. Obviously, Frank and Jason are very close. But um, who was it that he tossed in the Seho Ham fight uh, where he just, where Seho Ham was sitting there pounding away in knees oh. and then he grabs Seho oh, Ham. Yeah, he just tossed her out of the way to end the fight. And we're like, dude, that's violence against women. What are you doing, right? I think that was the Tomo Maisawa fight that happened. <laughs> it was so funny. He felt bad. He's like, well, I have to stop the fight. What do you want me to do? Right. So yeah, we, we go off on Herzog a lot, but uh, those breakfasts, uh, those, those lunches and sushi events with Herzog are hilarious. So he's a great, great human being to say the least. So it's actually funny. One, one of the questions we did have was uh, from my fight pizza. He wanted to know if you were going to be remote or live in Tokyo. I, you just kind of answered that. Uh, it's going to be remote. Uh, uh, but uh, actually, so, I'll go into the, uh, another question that a listener had, uh, our buddy C2 King Seal 24. He wants to know what your computer or uh, mic setup is for this remote broadcast. So he wants to know the technical side. Good of question. It. Good question. So I have um, everything to the side here. I use a snowball mic. It's a USB mic because uh, I definitely, I'm not using it now, but I definitely want uh, that audio to be crisp because they're going to have to use when the feed goes to them, um, they want to make sure they're able to raise the gain. Uh, so you want to get the best type of mic that you have. And I have that USB mic. I've used it for previous broadcasts. I do it for voiceover work. Uh, it's been golden up until now. So that'll be the mic I use. Uh, the headphones, technically, you can use whatever you want. But what I'm going to use, I'm going to use uh, a Bluetooth set. They're not Beats headphones. Uh, I wouldn't mind using the Beats headphones, but they're very similar. They're Bluetooth, but they're going to cover my ear. Because what I want is when, when the event actually starts, I'm going to crank it up from my end. Um, the trick that I taught Frank and Keith Herring back in the day, um, um, Joe Warren back in the day, depending on what we're doing, you want that level. If you're not in the venue, you want the level in your ears to be relatively that loud, not piercing, but loud enough to make you feel like you're in the arena. Therefore, if you're watching a fight, so it'll be here. It's an all-nighter for me, clearly, right? I'll be starting at what, 11 p.m., 12 p.m., uh, and going to like 9 a.m. So it's going to be an all-nighter. So what, around 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm a human. I'm going to start dragging down, dragging down, and getting tired. You know, you can only have so many Red Bulls and espressos, uh, you know, to keep you going. But I want that loudness in my ear so I feel like I'm in the arena. So when I'm calling a knockout or I'm calling a choke or I'm, call I'm calling a transition in a fight, I have that energy. you got to have that energy because you're not there. You're not in the arena to see it. Remember, where we sit in the arena, when we're by the ring, it's 20 feet from us, 10 feet from us sometimes. We're really, really close. So you can sense it. You can feel it. Uh, but you're in the arena. When you're not in the arena, and we've done broadcasts before where uh, we've been in a studio, crank up that volume, get, get into the zone where you feel like you're in the arena. That way you're able to call the fights accordingly, even though you're not there sitting uh, ringside. I think one so basically then... when you are trying to commentate a band, even if it means you have to talk over – some of Lenny Hart's greatest entrances, you Never. still have to make it sound like you're at least there. Yeah. Like it so I've got it a sound system. like a rock concert. Yeah, I got a system. Never speak over Lenny. Let Lenny mm -hmm. carry it. And then I follow. So, and Lenny and I have spoken about this because she, she complimented me about it before. I follow the cadence of her voice to the beat of the music because she's going to announce generally, I would say 99% of the time, uh, the fighter's um, name over the mm -hmm. beat of the music. And I try and catch that cadence on the beat so that if she ends it on the, whether it's a snare or a kick drum, that's when I take it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the only person I'll never, uh, I'll never really do an introduction for uh, is Mirko Krokop. Let, let, let wild boys play until he gets to the ring and then we'll take it from there. That's just out of respect uh, to the hardcore, the old school MMA community. You let Mirko Krokop mm -hmm. and wild boys, uh, you don't need to say anything about Mirko. If you don't know who Mirko Krokop is, uh, that that's on you. I mean, I should do it, but I can do a quick introduction of who Mirko Krokop is in his history, uh, briefly from when he enters the ring uh, until the announcer starts uh, or the, the ring announcer starts making the call. So uh, other than that, I follow Lenny's uh, lead 
And then from there, uh, you know, we, we try and match that vibe because you, well, you can't match her vibe. She's absolutely insane and awesome. So you do the best you can, can right? Exactly. I'm gonna, I think one of the things I'm going to miss, uh, well, for the, for the live shows, whenever uh, the, the show begins, they would always have you and Frank in front of the women, uh, the uh, the rising girls, the rising. Yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna miss that. That won't be uh, here for that show, unfortunately. That's a customary picture. It's it's Frank's wife who takes that picture. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so she's always there with us. Uh, it's it's just like it's the go-to beginning of the show. Unfortunately, it's not gonna happen for this show here. We get a kick out of it. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, she's teasing us. She's teasing Frank. She's teasing myself. And you know, the other people are laughing and they're like, "How are you so calm when you've got you know eight beautiful women behind you?" I'm like. It's just a shot, guys. It's just a regular introduction to a show. It's not like I'm going to talk to them and know who they are. They don't, they don't speak English. So uh, it's, it's a nice vanity shot. It looks beautiful. Uh, they look beautiful. And, you know, it, it is what it is. And then we just start to show off. I, I, guess I mean, so when that picture gets taken, it basically feels like it gives a Vegas type of vibe to the show, you know? Yeah. It's like when you have the showgirls plastered around you and you're just trying to focus, it's basically giving off that vibe. Yeah, it's but I mean, focusing is no longer an issue at my age. It's you, you've been around the world, you've been around the game long enough to, to not let you know it doesn't matter who's behind me or who's going on. I and mean, I think maybe in my 20s or 30s, I'd have probably started breaking a sweat. Uh, and like, oh my goodness, look at all these beautiful women behind me. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of you know, been in that situation many, many times. It just it is what it is, right? But uh, I do get a kick out of those pictures only because once the picture's taken. She'll then uh, send it over to me and then I'll post it on my social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And the reaction that I get, not just from obviously complete and random strangers uh, or MMA fans, but my own family and friends just is, has me in tears for the better part of a good couple of hours. Cause I'll just keep checking the updates or the morning thereafter. And some of the comments are hilarious, but uh, classy, but uh, they're, they're pretty funny. Actually, I, have a, right, I, I right, want to right. ask about the, about the social media comments and all that stuff. You kind of touched on it before when people criticize the way that you just uh, how you say names. I'm just curious to know how do you how do you block out the criticism as as a commentator and just all that stuff because it must be you must get both lots of positive, some negative. How do you how's that all? How do you deal with all of that and just um, do your I do get your thing? I get far more positive than I do negative, but I don't pay yeah. attention to the negative unless I can look at it as constructive criticism, right? Mm -hmm. People are going to rip you no matter what. If you're in the public eye, you're going to get ripped no matter what the anonymity standing behind or, you know, your phone, your keyboard, uh, whatever it may be, people are going to do that. So again, been around, doesn't bother me one bit. Now, if it's constructive criticism, I'll then take that and be like, you know what, moving forward, the next time we do something, I'm going to take that. And even though it came out from, you know, it came out potentially as a hater saying something, doesn't matter. If it's mm -hmm. constructive, it's going to, make me better to do it i know for a fact i don't do anything that is there to harm a fighter uh, uh his management uh their her management whomever her uh or rising or anything that i do when i'm hired to do an event i don't do anything purposely uh to garner any sort of negative feedback or hate therefore if somebody wants to do that that's not on me that's on them by all means you know you, you live your own life you got to do what you got to do I, I don't lose sleep over it. I learned the lesson a long time ago, and I think it was uh, UFC. Oh, it doesn't say in the past there. Shane Carwin, Shane Carwin, and uh, Brock Lesnar. Uh, and I remember after the show, I was there Octagon side and watched how you know Shane Carwin could have won that heavyweight title or unify the two titles at the time because I think he was the intern champ, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, and then Brock Lesnar turning it around and winning the fight. Um, the next day while I'm sitting at the airport, I think it was Vegas, I think it was in Vegas, um, mm -hmm. and just going through my, my social media feed and just catching some comments, I'll never forget some random person on Twitter calling Shane Carwin a meat sack, right? You're nothing, you're garbage, you're a meat sack. And in my head, I come from a school where, um, I don't know if you guys remember Vladimir Venichenko, um, mm -hmm. for the same school where... You, you don't say something to anybody unless you can back it up or if you're ready to, to throw down. So if I, if I mm -hmm. went to meet somebody that was twice my size and I said something to their face, that's because I'm looking to either, I'm going to throw down. I'm going to have to defend myself because that bigger guy is going to probably, even a smaller guy or girl, if you're going to start throwing threats around or insults, you need to be able to back it up because what you're doing is you're triggering or looking for a reaction that's going to trigger something that's going to be something that's going to end up pretty physical. Mm -hmm. physical when i saw that mm -hmm. i thought to myself dude you would never say that to shane carwin's face 
because first of all, nobody knows who you are. You've got all of 55 followers, if that, um, and you would never say that to Shane Carwin's face. Why? I know Shane Carwin personally. I know the size of his fists and the size of his hands. Uh, I know what it's like to be joking around with him. And, um, you know, when he puts his arm around you, give you a big hug, you're like, this guy's going to crush me. Right. And I looked at that. I thought to myself, wow, the anonymity and the, 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 the abuse of basically freedom of speech that people have to insult somebody whether it's a, a man, a woman. I mean, look at half the stuff that, that guys say about women. Look at all the, the, the Black Lives Matter stuff. And, and all that. It's, I sit there sometimes and I wonder, that's not on the individual who's receiving nine times out of 10, if their intent is fair. It's on the person sending. So therefore, if someone's going to insult me based on me simply doing my job and be akin to you know me outside cutting my grass and somebody stopping their car and saying, you know what, dude, your house sucks. You don't know how to cut grass. Uh, you, you're, 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 the, the, that door color, that garage color, that paint is garbage. Who are you? I live here. Hmm. And you know what? It's kind, of, it's kind of crazy, Joe, because, you know, they basically, you know, it's like the old saying goes, talk shit, get hit. They wouldn't hmm. say anything about Shane Carwin to their face because they know they would get their ass handed to them just like Jason Ellis did that one time when he fought them. <laughs> right, oh, it's, God, it's exactly the kid. So again, to answer your question, Andrew, I, or whoever, or I guess it was, was it, I don't know if it was you or, or a fan that uh, asked the question. I don't lose sleep over it. I really don't. If it's constructive, it's wonderful. It makes me a better broadcaster, perhaps a better human. But if it's just they're ripping me apart because they don't like me, or I don't know, because I, I shave my head, or because I'm Canadian, and some of the words come out with a Canadian accent. Oh well, like just go, 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 live your life. It is what it is. I'm not going to lose sleep over it at all. Uh, I get it. I totally get it. Uh, what uh, for Ryzen 26 though? Uh, one thing I'm curious to know is, uh, you know, being in Japan, you have the opportunity to talk to the fighters, be at the press conferences, all that stuff. With that not being as you, you won't have as much access. Has that, how, how are you doing like research and uh, getting familiar with, uh, with some of the fires that you may not have been as familiar with, you know, uh, from a, that have debuted like a few months ago? Yeah, so today was the basically, we call it the 18 hour interview day. So um, Shingo, our liaison, is, he interviews all the fighters uh, and he adds to our sheets that we have basically for the fights. Uh, at the same time, what I do is I love the Rise and Confession series uh, on YouTube. I watch those religiously mm -hmm. and I break them down because having been so lucky and blessed in what I do, when I'm interviewing somebody, uh, it's not just their answers because I'm also playing a, a, a psychological game with them. They're playing a psychological game with me. Um, it's no different than interviewing the Diaz brothers, right? Like in order to get anything out of the Diaz brothers or the Brock Lesnar's back in the day, you had to be specific in the angles that you were asked questions to get the answer that you wanted. It's also a mind game because you have to understand where are they right now? How far away are they away from making weight? Are you, are you dealing with a heavyweight who doesn't really have to cut weight? Are you dealing with a, a welterweight, a flyweight, someone that's in a miserable mood right now that, that you know, the last place they technically may want to be is speaking with me uh, about the fight. So um, I can't be there. Can't do the interviews. Shingle's going to be there. They've got all any types of beautiful notes. Uh, and, 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 you know, sends them over to us or puts a, a file together for us to review. So I've got my own research that I do, obviously, online and, and going through some of the trends that I see in some of the fights and, you know, who may have the edge. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll finish this off in a second. Uh, and then there's, again, like I said, the confession videos are just magical. Those YouTube series are just unbelievable. The quality is, is, is second to none. Um, and again, there's a difference between the Japanese, the translation from English from Japanese. So you have to understand what is the fighter really saying there? What are they really trying to get at, right? And then you got some of the guys that are just, you know, they're, they're absolute, you know, like, like Hiramoto and, and Hagiwara, they're, they're F-bombing, they're talking trash. <laughs> that's, that's what we are used to here in North America. So that's easy to sort of look at. Uh, but the other ones, like, you know, even, you know, Gomi thinks he's being, or Koji is kind of bullying Gomi and, you know, what's Gomi's reaction? Uh, anything Asakura, uh, you know, they're all saying that, you know, Horiguchi potentially, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's been already been knocked out. And you look at what Okibobu said um, about her, Horiguchi, how he does want him to win, but how Asakura basically is now going to be in his head because he came in full blitz and then bang, he got popped. Right. So there's that little mind game. Uh, obviously, Yamamoto, how she going to deal uh, with Hamasaki's exceptional ground game. If she's a wrestler, she's going to take her down. You know, you, you get after what. So that's the kind of stuff that I break down. But um, at its core, it's just simply 
do I really need to know that much information? I overanalyze, right? And it's just, it's me being the perfectionist. Realistically speaking, guys, what's my job, right? Introduce the, the player coming to the ring and then stick handling, the old hockey analogy, you stick handle, you set Frank Trigg up for the goal, right? He brings it mm -hmm. back to me. I stick handle what I see in the, in the ring. He finishes it off, right? So I don't have to go too crazy, right? It's not a history lesson. It's not a documentary that I'm doing. Just know enough. So for the viewer that doesn't know some information about the fighter or the fight, share it. Right, right. Of course, of course. And you know what? That kind of leads me to the last question we'll ask. You basically said you have your palms in a lot of different places. You're doing real estate. You're a commentator for, I don't know if it's a second division soccer team up in Canada or Close, close. Yeah, so it's more, it's, I'm in the mortgage space, so the loan officer space, I guess you would call it in the States, but mortgages. So I, I help financing. Uh, you know, my tagline is basically I make happy places a reality, right? Mm -hmm. I'll, 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 you know, I'll underwrite your, your, your income and where you are right now to make sure we can get the financing for the property you want to buy. I've got tons of real estate agents that work with me that, you know, will send me their clients. Uh, I also do, uh, I'm the voice of what's called York 9 FC. It's actually York United now. Uh, it's a professional mm -hmm. soccer team. So you guys have the MLS or we have the MLS uh, in North America, but the three teams in Canada play in the MLS. The MLS is a domestic American league, right? We now have oh, a yeah. Canadian premier league with, with uh, eight professional teams now, and there could be nine coming up. Um, well, COVID kind of messed that up, but I'm the voice, I'm the stadium voice of York nine or York United in my area. So, you know, I, I do the introductions, uh, goal scored substitutions, obviously emergency uh, announcements. If we have to get people out of the stadium sort of thing. So uh, I'm also a head coach and well, this is what my, Oh, wow, family wow. game. Uh, I'm a head that's coach for a, a, a rep soccer team, uh, my son's team. Uh, so that's kind of my passion. That's what that's what I do on a regular basis. Um, the the MMA stuff, um, you know, Ryzen is, is the only organization that I do play by play for. Uh, if I was to get offers again from because I turned some down uh, just from timing perspective. Um, but with my mortgage business and with the with the obviously the income and the 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 what I generate with that, I'm now in the driver's seat. Right. If, if somebody wants me to, to do play by play for an organization, but they're going to offer me peanuts, you know, you're not taking me away from my family uh, and my son. And my and you know what? You know what, Mr. Farrell, I can understand all that. But the main question I was trying to ask is if people stop by or people stop you by or if they get you from the real estate job or from the PA announcing job or York United, I mean, how do you get fans get non-MMA fans casually involved with caring about a promotion like Rise. Yes. So you break, you break it down, explain to them. Um, so people will still stop me to this day, pumping gas at the grocery store, jogging down the street, uh, whether I'm coaching a team across my region and they know me as showdown Joe, right? Mm -hmm. So they will ask me what's happening in your world from the MMA space. And I always let them know, I'm still doing uh, Ryzen. If you guys remember Pride back in the day, Pride mm -hmm. became Ryzen. I've been the color commentator with Frank Trigg pretty much from day one. And understand that the Japanese mixed martial arts culture and the, and the talent in there uh, can outweigh much of the talent around the world. And that usually stops them. Well, what do you mean? Right? I said, if you ever get a chance, just Google it. Just go on YouTube and watch some of the Ryzen content. Hey, forget about that. I do the play by play. Just forget about that. Watch the quality of talent that you see there. I said, there are two guys in Japan. They're the Diaz brothers of Japan, the Esakura brothers. The people are like, what? What do you mean? I said, these guys, street fighters, they came from the streets. Uh, they, they fought in the outsider organization. They now compete at a high level in what you think is pride, but now it's called Ryzen. And that kind of garners that interest. Uh, also via social media, let people know that I'm doing this, doing that. Uh, you know, it's, I, I liked it better when I was able to travel there because you could sort of, you know, follow my, I'm at the airport now, I'm leaving soon, see you in 14 hours. Oh, just landed here and, you know, get more uh, awareness that way. It's harder now, but other than that, just getting people to realize that, you know, come New Year's Eve, there is a fantastic card happening overseas uh, in Japan that will blow your mind away. If you are a fight fan uh, and you and you like high quality fights, you cannot miss this show. You, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice uh, by not tuning in or ordering this pay-per-view uh, because Japan is completely different than North America. So I sell it in a manner to explain to them, um, you know, they don't care about losses in Japan. They care about the performance. So if that's the case, then you're guaranteed, or for the most part, spectacular fights coming from, from two different fighters. So. 
Oh, so right. my last question to you, uh, Joe, is before you head out is, which fight are you looking forward to the most? Man, that's impossible to answer, dude. It is so impossible to answer. It's Obviously, the main event. Fight for it, to be honest, because there's a whole lot to look forward to. But what fight are you specifically looking forward to the most? I can't. Man. Take I, time. I, I, you could, uh, you main could. event. Main event. Obviously, I want to see how Horiguchi does. Um, you know, but there's there's just ridiculous. Obviously, with you know Ota making his MMA debut. Right. I mean, we're talking about a silver medalist taking on a veteran in Hideo Takoro. Like there's so much thing. Sasaki, how, how is he going to handle getting punched in the face after he had his jaw crushed by Asakura? Right. Mm -hmm. So there's so many that look here and, you know, I against Asakura. That's a ridiculous fight. Right. Like they're, they're just it's going to be nuts. But if you want me to pick one. Um, Which one has you throttling in the mouth that like I cannot wait to see how this goes down? Yeah, it's, it's got to be the main event because I don't ah. think Asakura can, well, I shouldn't say he can't lose. Neither one of those fighters can really lose because it's, you know, we're talking about an organic developed main event that is, you know, argue, I, I'm going to think it's probably the, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the biggest Japanese rematch of all time. I mean, can you think it of anything is. bigger? In modern time, yeah. No, no modern time, it's got to be. It's the only thing I, I can... You know, other than, you know, Tension versus Takaru from K1, it's probably the biggest fight that could be made in Japan right now. This, this point. Yeah, well, yeah, the Takaru fight's going to be insane if they could pull out. <laughs> yeah, think, right? if, if. Yeah. But right, right now, you, you, I think you answered. I would have also accepted Hiromoto versus Hagiwara just because they're throwing F-bombs and talking shit to each other. And I think that, that's, that's old school, right? That's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's how the sport was started. Two street fighters going in. Now you got rules to follow, boys. Let's see what you can do. And the fact that, you know, Hagiwara says, I'm going to slice this guy up with elbows. I mean, that right there is like, when that fight goes down to the ground, what's the first thing you're looking for? If he gets the mound, you're going to yeah. want to start seeing some elbows. Can he actually do it, right? Two so tattooed Japanese fight. fighters saying that they're going to kick each other's ass and they're going to choke each other out. That's something you never see in Japanese fight. And, and I mean, it, it's so it's something you would more so see here in this continent, in North America, basically. Yeah, Hagiwara said he deserves a public execution. <laughs> yeah. Oh, How gangster is that? Exactly. Very gangster. Uh, wait, so. Oh, Joe, uh, before you go, we want to give you an opportunity to uh, get out your plugs, uh, anything that you want to, you know, get, get out there to the world. Listen, tune in, guys. Just tune in. Uh, don't need to promote anything other than this fantastic show. I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed to be able to do it. I'm thankful for uh, technology that will allow me to do it from home, despite the fact that, like, you know, we're, all of us, we're going to have to be watching it uh, all night. It's all nighter, right? The Red Bulls and the Espressos and whatever I can. I'm going to have to, you know, create. The good thing about Japan is we used to get bento boxes. You know, you guys know what bento boxes are, right? We used to call it the surprise mm -hmm. meals. You don't know what it is until you open it. Uh, so I'm going to probably design or create my own bento boxes here. Uh, probably be super healthy because I've got to monitor my calories nowadays. Uh, but other than that, uh, nothing really to promote. I, I, I really appreciate it. I can keep going if you guys want. I mean, I got, I'm looking at my calendar now. My next one's uh, not for another 15 minutes. So. Oh, okay. Cause you, you, going, said, you said 10 30. I didn't want, I didn't want to keep you. Uh, I didn't I'll want keep to keep going. I got, I, we can go 10 more minutes if you like. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Actually, well, actually one of my questions I got to ask is this, um, when you got the the car the fight card from uh, Shingo whoever from Ryzen and you saw what do you think about this Shibatar versus TBA TBA fight? If you um, have you looked up Shibatar at all and like yeah, is he not like the Logan Paul of Japan? Uh, uh, I, um, no, we don't want to compare Akitoshi Shibatar Saito to Logan Paul because those are two entirely different beasts to deal with. I, I no, get, I'm thinking I might be thinking of something else. Hold you on think, a second here. I think yeah, the YouTube thing. I think you. I think you're kind of on spot. Yeah, you're basically looking at the whole comedic YouTuber aspect. But but, but at least Saito takes his crap seriously than the damn Paul brothers. Shibatar okay. is basically a guy who. He's a YouTube guy who goes around and gets his ass kicked uh, for YouTube videos. Uh, Azakura brothers both kicked his ass. Um, what? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, in exhibition fights. Yeah. And and he's having a TVA. F so, like, I have never seen that in MMA ma uh, an MMA show where, some where somebody is saying, to be announced, taking on somebody. And well, I have it's no Japan, idea. right? It is in Japan. I have it's no idea. Japan New Year's Eve special. That's exactly what it is, right? I, just, it full I, sense. I don't know if this is going to be like a work MMA match or if this is going to be like Ryzen introducing somebody like, like I don't well, know, Bob Sapp or something. If you think about this, if you yeah. think about this for just one second, around 12 years ago, they had a fight between Bob Sapp 
and a guy dressed up as Kaniku Man, or as we know here in North America, Ultimate Muscle. You know, and they had some guy dressed up in a suit of Ultimate Muscle, and Bob Sapp beat that guy. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that basically shows the type of mystery and aura that there is when it comes down to Japanese combat sports. Am I right, Mr. Ferraro? Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that alone sums up Japanese MMA. You have no idea who's fighting until the minute it's announced, right? So, and I mean, if you think about it as the promotion, they're not going to give, give Shibatar somebody that he's going to beat. They're going to give him somebody that's going to, you know, not someone that's going to be like going to kill the guy, but enough to say, you know what, you are going to get your behind handed to you for a good five to 10 minutes. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that's what I can see there. There, So it's good. It's going to be fun. I think it's going to be great. Just to go back to the previous question before the person yeah. that was asking me about what I'm going to be using. Oh, um, yes. uh, so the microphone, obviously the headphones and I use an iMac. So my iMac, uh, obviously it's got uh, pretty good RAM. Uh, so you no, know, there shouldn't be any issues whatsoever with my video quality and audio quality going to Japan and anything coming back. So I want to make sure we close that one off there. Got, gotcha. I'm actually curious to know as well, what's been your favorite call for a Ryzen show so far? Uh, Crow Cup winning the, the tournament was great. That, that, that's mm-hmm. always been wonderful. Um, I mean, tension against Floyd Mayweather. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can literally say I call the Floyd Mayweather fight, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and tension being who he is, is just a magical, magical, I mean, some of the stuff he does is ridiculous. I mean, I, I, I can't even, the guy's a human wizard, right? It's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But uh, favorite calls. I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking the Crow Cup winning the, winning the uh, tournament that one year. So I think that's, that's arguably one of my favorites. I would have also yeah, accepted the 16 tournaments, but we also... couldn't probably get over the fact that Joe Warren was being such an ass on commentary that it almost took away the feeling of the fight. <laughs> yeah, sometimes not... it could be a little awkward, but when you're, when you're a color commentator saying certain things uh, and you're just like, I can't, I can't acknowledge that. I legitimately <laughs> cannot acknowledge that because that would put me in a, in a precarious situation. And it's happened with almost every, no, I should say every. Um, I, I've done shows with, you know, with Frank and Heath and Joe Warren and Kamara Usman and, and, and Jose Torres. Sometimes things come out of their mouth. They don't realize, dude, the world's listening. The, the world's watching. I'm not when that red that. light's on, you know yeah. you better not fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've also accepted uh, your call of Bob Sapp versus Osuna Rashi. Because you and Frank Trigg, when it, you were on commentary for that, I was dying at, at the commentary between you two for that match. Yeah, I think I lose my mind. Yeah, well, that was that was insane. I think I, I lose my mind a lot when, you know, two two men, two two ladies are in the middle of the ring and just throwing down, and throwing down, mm-hmm. and throwing down, and I'm just kind of like, what, how is this happening? Like. How is nobody going down and they're still going and they're still going. And it's just, for me, it turns into a field day, right? Like throw, you know, a lot of my professionalism out the window and be like, what am I watching here? This is insanity personified, right? So uh, that's the kind of stuff I really, I mean, who doesn't enjoy seeing that? I I love transition. I love grappling transitions. I love slickness because, you know, how fast can you call it as it's happening? And if the action is faster than I can verbally explain it, that's magic. That's complete and utter magic, right? So... Well, that's one thing. It's basically, I've, I, like watching the first Hagler Hearns fight on repeat over and over again. Insanity. As that's that one of just insanity. Well, that's you know you brought up tension before, and I'm always just wondering, like, how does somebody commentate a tension fight? Because literally, he seems to be doing what he seems to be ten steps ahead of everybody else that's in the room, and yeah. like by the time he's already, you've already gone like, oh, he went for a jab. He's already done three or four other moves by then. So like, how do you, how, do, how is it like, how do you even like commentate attention fight? Cause it, it, it must be like, it's gotta, it be, that's gotta be difficult. It's a challenge. It's a challenge because you want Frank to speak as well. Yeah. Right. But so many things are happening that he's there to, ex- so he's there to break it down and explain I'm there to call it. So if it's happening so fast, like especially the tension and, and uh, Mayweather fight, I spent more time talking and poor Frank wasn't able to explain anything until the replay, which is fine, which is his job anyways. Right. But I was sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness, what's happening here? So it's crazy. So, you know, calling attention fight at times is fun. Uh, but like you, you alluded to, it's challenging. It can be like mm-hmm. he, by the time you say something, he's done three, four, five different things. Um, and, and, and but the beauty in that is so one of the things that gets said to, to Frank and I sometimes and people are like, Joe, how do you know what's about to happen? It's like you're, you've already seen it before it happens. 
but that's that's putting in your 10,000 hours, right? Like I've, I've been doing this for so long that certain trends, certain things happen um, and you, you know it's going to happen, right? It's akin to me being, uh, now, can I physically do it? No, but I've seen it so many times that, well, if he does this, that's going to happen. If that, that, that and it just, it's going to happen, right? Or setups. I've seen a setup so many times, right? I can never stop them. If I'm in the gym or training, I can't, I'm just, I'm too old now at this point, right? But I've seen it so many times that I think I know what's going to happen next, right? And, and people are like, oh, it's like, it's like the fight is fixed for you. No, it's not. I, I know it's going to happen. You just see it, right? I'm wrong many times, but it is what it is. Uh, it's like Anderson Silva back in his, his, his prime. Um, I used to tell people all the time, he sees fighting in slow motion, right? He knows exactly what you're going to do. Um, there was a thing when I had my TV show on here in Canada, Sportsnet, um, it's called UFC Central back in the day. And I had a thing that was, I had a segment that was called the beginning of the end. Okay. And it used to drive me insane and mad whenever I would watch the NFL or NBA or NHL or whatever, when they would show a highlight and, and being the coach that I am, it wasn't the highlight of the basket being dunked or the score, or the, the goal being scored or the knockout or the submission. Where did it start from? Because something had to happen. So I would have this thing called beginning of the end. And I, I, the first time I used it, um, uh, I think it was with um, when Silva fought Irwin. Um, and Anderson was in a southpaw stance. And I remember watching it live and Anderson's throwing his jab and southpaw stance. And he's just paying attention to what um, Irwin was doing. And all of a sudden, he switches his stance, knowing full well that the minute he went from southpaw to orthodox, bang, a kick was going to come. And as soon as that kick come, he grabbed the kick, bang, punched him in the face, game over. So what they were showing on the highlights was the grabbing of the kick and punching. I'm like, no, he was analyzing him. If I throw this, what's he going to do? If I throw that, what's he going to do? If I do this, that, that, that. That's the, that's the study of, of, of combat that I love the most is to be able to look at something ahead of time and say, hold on, he's setting this up. Watch that right knee. That right knee's coming. I, I, I th and then bang, when that right knee happens, Frank gives me that little elbow. He's like, nice. You saw that. I go, but that's a setup. I could see it happening, right? And, but you can't really, like with a Floyd Mayweather or a tension, you're not going to figure it out. You're just not <laughs> going to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm, uh, exactly. But the other ones, you can actually see what's going to happen because I've seen it so many times. Uh, it's no different than when I'm coaching a game, right? I'm coaching a soccer game uh, and I see something that I don't like and I got to pull a player off to replace them where I see what the other team is doing, the formation, well, they're heavy on the left side. So I'm going to load up my right side. I'm going to stall them. and I'm going to see what they do and what formation they're going to change. And then I'll take it from there, right? So it's no different than any other sport. Um, you know, I've done it before at Raptors games, you know, breaking down the Raptors um, and just what, what, you know, what, what Nick Nurse is doing as a coach and what he potentially is setting up, what the opposition mm -hmm. is doing. That's my favorite part uh, of the sport. Sports in general is to be able to see and predict what's happening. And again, let me repeat, I don't know what tension is going to do. You can't pretty much predict that uh the asakura brothers especially kai difficult horiguchi i can sort of get some of the stuff but it's just so fast right but the yamamoto hamasaki fight chances are you're going to be able to predict certain things that me is going to want to do to set up the takedown you're going to predict what uh, hamasaki is going to do when she gets taken down right uh but it is mma right you just you never really know but hopefully right so mm -hmm. right right and you know what? One more question I have to ask. Obviously, you mentioned Floyd Mayweather and Tenshin Nasakawa. Obviously, you were the only you are the only other Canadian to commentate a match of both of theirs, aside from Moore Ronaldo, who's obviously one of the greatest Canadian broadcasters of all time. But every event that he treats gets treated like it's a big deal. Now, when you first started your commentary career, when you first started your career doing rising events or MMA events in general, do you ever see doing fight cards as something like a big deal or, you know, it's just another fight? Always a big deal. I think I understand your question, but it's always a big deal. Again, like I said at the beginning of the call, I'm lucky to do what I do. Like it's a blessing mm -hmm. to be able to do this kind of stuff because, you know, there are so many other options that could be hired. Right. Um, you know, if, but I've always said to myself, if, if it ends today, it ends today. It is what it is. Right. Uh, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, but I enjoy it so much that, you know, I will be sitting here alone uh, in 24 hours and, you know, uh, and, and watching and thinking, man, it, uh, I, I, when I go to Saitama Arena, I'm always looking around. I'm just like, wow, how many incredible fights 
uh, have I been lucky enough to call in here, but how many fights from the pride days happened in here that were absolute mayhem, mayhem. Mm -hmm. So I know how lucky I am to be able to do what I do. When I used to do Titan FC shows, right? Mm -hmm. Like oh, I go to Florida, you're in the middle of nowhere. That's man, I'm, I'm in Florida, I'm a Canadian, right? Right now there's about five inches of snow up there and I'm in Florida in shorts. You know, my friends are at home, you know, all freaking out and jealous. I'm loving life. I'm living it and, and you know, enjoying it and sitting down and, and, you know, when I was at the ring there or a cage at the time and, and just enjoying it because you never know who you're going to be calling, which fight are you going to be calling, what's going to happen with that person, right? Or, you know, male or female. So um, every event to me is, is just, is, is I'm lucky. I'm beyond lucky to be able to do this, hands down. Now, I don't know if you can answer this question or, or how much you can answer it, but uh, has Ryzen said that you guys will be on English commentary going forward into 2021, or is this a one-time thing for live now? Is there anything you can say about that at this point? To be honest with you, nothing has been discussed. I don't know, but in, in listening and, and having the conversations, I think with this format, uh, if it's successful, uh, I will not be surprised if they continue to do this. Um, which is fine, which is great. I mean, nothing compares to being at the venue, um, but I, I will have no issues whatsoever if this is the way, especially in the world, the pandemic that we live right now, if this is how we're going to be doing shows moving forward, uh, ideally, I, I would love to go to Japan at least once a year, right? And But that's just me being greedy, right? That's just me being greedy. Um, at the same time, if they say that, listen, you, you guys are never coming back to Japan, you're just doing the commentary from home uh, moving forward, and that that I'll be completely fine with that as well. Whatever I can do to help rise or help rise and whatever I can um, help for, help the promotion get to the next level and and continue to have this kind of fun, I'm down. I, I'm not complaining. About I hope it doesn't come that. I hope that right. it's all the only over. thing that's for sure though is that nothing's for sure. You gotta be sure to make that impression on that fan trying to watch for the first time and think, you know, this is something I'm gonna go back to, you know, for years on end, basically. That's a fantastic point. That's a fantastic point. So going back to when you were asking me the question before about, you know, how do I treat some of the commentary? I treat it in a manner like it's this, it's, this person is watching for the very first time versus mm -hmm. this person here who's watching his 10,000th fight. Where's mm -hmm. the bridge in the middle, right? How do you make it, how do you make it that the newbie understands, oh, what's, what's an arm bar or Oh, wow. You, you can take people down to the ground. That's insane. Whereas the other person is like, I've seen that a thousand times. That's a high crotch. He's going to, he's going to dummy. He's going to land him on his head. He's going to elbow him to sleep. Right. Where's that middle ground that you kind of, you know, make it easy for that first timer and, 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 and okay for that veteran. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, here's the, 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 the real last question I have for you. Any rise and survive intermission survival tips you got? Because you've been in that arena for, you know, sometimes maybe an hour and a half, you know, with an intermission. Anything you got for people that are going to be East Coast, you know, or, you know, over here? How can we best survive a rise and intermission? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you because the rise and intermissions for me are, an, you guys won't believe this, are an absolute blessing. Oh. They're a blessing not the, not the long ones, but yes. a blessing because I get to go to the bathroom. I get to go to the washroom because when I used to do Titan shows, I would stop drinking water at 2 p.m. Because I know hmm. the minute that broadcast starts, 6 o'clock or whatever UFC fight pass, whatever had it started, let's say 6 o'clock, I'm not getting up from that seat until midnight, maybe 1 a.m. So the last thing you want to be doing is pounding back water all day long. Right, you're not going to be able to hold it. Literally, at Ryzen, never a problem. Intermission joy. And I would always ask, "How much time do I have?" Oh, well, you got about 25 minutes. Beautiful. I'll walk up to that bathroom over there. Done. Come back. When they told me that you know the intermission is going to be 80 minutes, 90 minutes, I'm like, "You're going to lose everybody around the world, other than the people in here." Right? <laughs> um, it, it's I, I don't right now. I'm going to be one of you guys within 24 hours, trying to figure out how am I going to last. Uh, if the intermission is, because I know right now there's there's two intermissions that are scheduled. Yes. Okay. But the beauty of this card here um, is they have to get people out of the arena, I think, by 8 p.m. local time. Oh, right? yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. Something, something like that. They're, yeah. They're, they're, because uh, the subways are going to stop running. Yeah, yeah. They have to get people out of the arena. Therefore, uh, in order to do so, you got to move this card up. You got to move it down. Now, the problem is, is they do have other broadcasting situations down there where they have to adhere to. So sometimes when the fights go too quick, 
they have no choice because if the broadcast starts on Fuji TV at you know 8 p.m., but all the fights are done by 5.30 p.m., they have no choice, right? So on the broadcast, I guess they can show replays. I don't know what they usually do generally, but other than that, they have no choice, and that's why those intermissions are so long. But uh, I'm with you two right now, and, and everyone else is going to be tuning in from around the world. It's going to suck. I got to figure it out. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to have some coffees made. I'm going to have my own bento boxes made. Uh, anything to give me energy. Um, again, it's probably tomorrow night. It's going to probably be minus five degrees Celsius uh, outside. Mm. I might just in an intermission, walk outside, <laughs> uh, get that cold air going. Uh, and, and that's it. Right. I'm so. going to say you should just open a window and just put your head outside just to get that, 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 that freezing weather. That'll, 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 that'll wake you up immediately. I might do that. I might do that. Exactly. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, it's, I, I know it's going to be a challenge. I know it's going to be a challenge. But in a, way, yeah. in a way, it's like you said, it's your calm down period. It's the period where you have to, you know, rest and recuperate. I'm not trying to say take a nap and, you know, get right back up when the intermission's over. I'm just saying it's a way that you can, you know, rest yourself, rest your voice, you know, drink some hot tea if you need to. Yeah, a little bit of lemon water. water. Guarantee you're right. But there'll be no naps. There's no naps. <laughs> I, dude, if I take a nap, it's game over. And Frank will be on exactly. his own. It'll be on his own. I'm not taking a nap. I'll have to figure out how to stay up, but that'll be fun. Uh, uh, but uh, Joe, if you gotta go now, uh, uh, you know, you gotta go now, but you know, if, yeah. Yeah, if, if is, uh, do you have any social media that you wanna plug or you know, anything of that sort? Uh, yeah, want- uh, Twitter is Joe A. Ferrara. I look forward to hearing everyone's comments. I think Frank's wife is gonna be running the Twitter, his, tr- his Twitter account. Uh, so we do look forward to that. Uh, you know, Joe A. Ferraro for me. Uh, Instagram is the same, Joe A. Ferraro. And on Facebook, just look me up. Uh, you'll see Joe Ferraro Mortgages or Joe Ferraro Mortgage Agent. And my personal one uh, is just Joe Ferraro, I believe. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I'd you know, mm-hmm. love to connect with everybody on social media. I look forward to all of your comments. Uh, again, haters, if you, you can say whatever you want, it's, it's not going to bother me whatsoever. Uh, say what you got to say. But other than that, guys, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I look forward to... Uh, to hear what you guys have to say after the show. And of course, uh, I'm sure there'll be some comedic flair coming through uh, throughout the broadcast. Uh, and should I apologize now for what Frank may be saying about me on the show or just let it go? Uh, hmm, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave you it up to go you. Ahead and do that. Yeah, you can go you ahead and apologize. apologize in advance if you feel like it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Frank's going to do it because he's not next to me this time. So he's going to take liberties at the fact that he's in LA and I'm just north of Toronto. Oh. I'm sure the whole Canadian jokes and the ripping me apart will, uh, will continue. But we have a lot of fun with that. I got no complaints whatsoever. About Frank, so. but yeah, we're looking forward to you and uh, Frank being back on the uh, back with the uh, mic, headphones and mics. You know, glad that you know it, got, it happened for New Year's. Really glad that it ha- actually got to happen for the biggest show of the year. Really, yeah, it's gonna be fun. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. No problem, Joe. We appreciate no it. And okay. we are good. And we're clear. <laughs>